Today we come to the third sweet story about Easter. And here we are on the Lord's Day, the day where the world ostensibly celebrates the resurrection of Christ. But I want to tell a little story about a friend of mine, Dave Dixon, who lives in California. Dave taught woodshop in a high school there and had an excellent program. They didn't make bird houses and candy dishes. They made beautiful furniture, including handmade grandfather clocks. And actually, the governor at the time, Governor Schwarzenegger, visited the shop and actually had one of these beautiful clocks constructed for him. I'm privileged to have one in my living room. Not a nail in it, beautiful inlay just uh, masterpieces. Well, they were building a table, a special table, which many churches use for their Lord's Supper, their communion, on which to put the bread and wine in memory of Christ's death for us, and very often inscribed on it, as it was on this table, were the words, this do in remembrance of me. This was the request of the Lord Jesus. You can find it in Luke 22, verse 19, where he asked his followers to remember, to call to mind his death for them. So as they were constructing, David with three of his students were constructing the table, one of these young men asked the following question. And this is Dave writing. He says, while we were assembling the table, one of my students asked me, who died? I told the group that my best friend died a while back. Then I said that my friend, three days after he was buried, came alive out of the grave. He writes, you should have seen the look on their faces. It was priceless. They wrote, I'm sure they thought Mr. Dixon has lost his mind. Then he said, I had the privilege of sharing the gospel with them. So what is the gospel? Our third important question is, don't you want to know him? This one who the Bible says gave his life for us. When we think about the gospel, the word gospel is simply an old English word meaning the good news. This is God's good news to the human race. And it has certain historical components and then certain personal components. And it's important to understand this. If you want to see the historical components, you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And here we read the Apostle Paul writing in verse 3, For I have delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, what that means is that hundreds of years before he died, in some cases well over a thousand years before he died, the events that surrounded the trial and execution of the Son of God were pre-recorded in the Hebrew Scriptures, including how much they would pay for his betrayal, what would happen to the money that they used to pay for it, how he would be executed. Hundreds of years before the development of crucifixion, David described in detail how they would pierce his hands and feet what they would do with his clothes in gambling for his outer garment and tearing his inner garment in parts, how they would pierce his side, and so on. All of these details were given long before the event. And that's what Paul is alluding to here. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. This should have been no surprise to the Jewish people because it was prophesied in graphic detail in the Hebrew Scriptures, and, part two, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Again, 
David wrote concerning this event, saying that God would not leave his son in the grave or suffer his body to see corruption, but would actually raise him up from the dead. And then the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and then part four, that he would be seen by witnesses, hundreds of eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Christ. Now, when these people confessed that they had seen Jesus alive, they could be signing their death warrant. And so it was a very serious thing. And yet there were hundreds of them. You can imagine in a court case, if you brought one person up to testify to something, and then they sat down, and then a second person, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. And by this time, the judge might be saying, I think you've proved your point. But there are over 500 at one time. Scores of people, including Saul of Tarsus, who hated the name of Jesus and who killed Christians for a living until he came up against overwhelming evidence that Jesus was alive. He met him the last person he expected to meet alive. And so, the gospel as to its historical necessities has to do with the death of Christ for our sins and his burial and his rising again for our justification. That is, because he rose from the dead, this was God's receipt to guarantee that all our sins had been paid in full. Because if one sin was left unpaid for, Jesus would still be in the grave. And how do we know that? Because of the basic elements in the practical response to the gospel. These are the historical details. But from a practical point of view, the Bible tells us not simply that Christ died. Christ died for our sins. We were all sinners before God, guilty before God deserving of God's judgment, but Christ died for our sins. And he rose again in the power of an everlasting, of an endless life, and not only died for us, but then offers to give that life to us as a free gift. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, the same man, Paul, preached the gospel across the ancient world, and he tells us in Acts chapter 20 the two essential elements practically to the gospel. In other words, what is your response to this message? And he puts it this way. This is in Acts chapter 20 and verse 21. Repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word repentance means a change of mind. People do not think rightly about this. They say things all the time that are contradictory to what God says. I think I'm a pretty good person. I'm not all that bad. I think I'll make it on my own. I'm trying to be a good person, doing good things, and so on. Now, God says there's none righteous, not even one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are all under the wrath of God, deserving of his judgment. So, we have to change our mind about that. Not only the fact that we are sinners, deserving sinners, hell-deserving sinners, but that we can't fix ourselves. There's nothing we can do to merit God's salvation. Everything I seek to do for him, he has to give me the strength, the conscious thought, the material supply, in order to do things for him. In other words, every good work you do puts you deeper into God's debt. You can't do this. You can't trade good things for bad things. You can't do that before any court in the land. Say, well, yeah, I know I murdered the guy, but I cut his grass for 20 years. That should count for something. You can't do that. We're guilty as charged before God. That's what repentance is standing in my heart before God and saying, God, you're right, guilty as charged. But then the other side is, and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. 
agreeing with God that his solution is the only one that will work. Look, if you could get to heaven by your own good works, Jesus wouldn't have died. He went to the cross and paid the price and now offers salvation as a free gift. It's the only way you can have it, but you can have it. You can have forgiveness for your sins and the gift of eternal life, a new kind of life that guarantees you a place in the family of God and eventually in God's home in heaven. That's the good news. And every person who has ever believed what God says about them and about Christ has found out it's true. You'll know it's true when it happens to you.